In the world of pro wrestling, when a work turns into a shoot, real violence can often hide behind a theatrical facade. An uncooperative exchange, a suspiciously real looking hold, a single well-placed kick. Rarely in these incidents does the shooter abandon all pretense of performance and just lay the violence out for everyone to see. But 70 years ago, the father of Japanese pro wrestling did just that. In a blockbuster super fight that was supposed to end in a tie, Ricky Dozan left the legendary judo fighter Masahiko Kimura bleeding, broken, and unconscious on the mat. In a double cross that earned him death threats from the Yakuza, and catapulted him even further into stardom. This is the story of Ricky Dozan versus Masahiko Kimura. First, the father of Japanese pro wrestling, Ricky Dozan. Although he was a Japanese national hero in his day, Ricky Dozan started life as the son of a farmer in what is now North Korea. In 1940, he left his family farm to pursue a career as a sumo wrestler in Japan. And for the next 10 years, that's exactly what he did. After a financial dispute with his sumo stable, he quit the sport and moved on to pro wrestling. Now, pro res hadn't taken hold in Japan yet, so Ricky Dozen found himself training and competing in the United States. Once he was ready, he headed back to Tokyo and founded his own promotion. And this is where things would really blow up for the man from North Korea. He started setting himself up with Western opponents who would play the foreign heel characters to his supposedly homegrown hero. One after another, dastardly American foes, bigger and meaner than Ricky Dozan, would fall in front of mass audiences of early Japanese television watchers. In a downtrodden post-war Japan, he rose as a pop cultural hero, beating American wrestlers and winning back some small amount of the respect and national self-esteem that was lost in 1945. In fact, Luthez went as far as to say he was like a god in Japan. He popularized pro wrestling in the country almost single-handedly. He trained the founders of both New Japan and All Japan Pro Wrestling and truly was the father of Japanese pro wrestling. But while in the public eye he was viewed as a hero, behind the scenes, Ricky Dozan had a bit of a dark side. He was a hard drinking, hard partying man with connections to Japan's Yakuza underworld. And he was boisterous to the point of being a problem. According to the book Shooters by Jonathan Snowden, if Ricky Dozan thought someone was wasting his time, he'd drop his pants and start masturbating in public. A loose cannon to say the least. Masahiko Kimura, too, had a life story that would put some superhero comics to shame. By all accounts, he was something of a prodigy in the world of judo, apparently becoming the youngest ever fifth degree black belt at 18 years old. He was a fanatical trainer, known for knocking out sparring partners by throwing them to the mat, and there are even stories of him practicing his Osotogari technique on literal trees in the forest. Kimura was a national judo champion many times over, and in 1951 had his legendary fight against Helio Gracie in front of thousands of people in Brazil. It was an early super fight of sorts for martial arts supremacy in which Kimura broke Gracie's arm twice before his brother had to throw in the towel. And of course, his name is attached to the now famous double wrist lock. If there's one thing to understand about Masahiko Kimura for the purposes of this story, it's that when it comes to pro wrestling, he was a real shooter, as real as they come. Speaking of which, in 1951, Kimura founded his own pro wrestling company, the Kokusai Pro Wrestling Association. He had a sick wife and a child to take care of, and being a national judo champion just was not paying the bills. And it wouldn't be long before Ricky Dozan invited the judoka over to his JWA, where the two would form a blockbuster tag team. Their programs against the Sharp Brothers, two giant men from Canada who played the role of foreign heels, was instrumental in popularizing pro wrestling in Japan. As much as Ricky Dozan is the father of pro res, Kimura was right there with him forming that early legacy. And eventually, a super fight of their own was proposed. 
partner against partner. The judo god versus the pro wrestling legend in the making for the first ever Japanese heavyweight wrestling championship. Masahiko Kimura versus Ricky Dozan. Now let's get to their one and only infamous match. It happened December 22, 1954 at Sumo Hall in Tokyo, and things start off completely normal. With Kimura barefoot in trunks and Ricky Dozan wearing long pants and wrestling boots, they go through a series of lockups, a rope break, a takedown by Ricky Dozan, and the application of head scissors. In fact, if it wasn't for the slower, almost lazy tempo, this could be the opening to a modern pro res match. Things continue for a while along these lines, with lots of long clinches and lockups, usually resulting in Ricky Dozen throwing Kimura to the ground. In fact, the former sumo kind of manhandles the judoka here. He's really not letting him get in much offense of any description. And then comes a judo style throw attempt by Kimura that Ricky Dozen is strangely uncooperative on. A little foreshadowing, perhaps, of what's about to come. Ricky Dozan starts threatening with this karate style chop that was his signature move. Not long after, Kimura throws a kick out, a kick that hits Ricky Dozan in the groin. And all of a sudden, the pro wrestling match is over. The shoot has begun. In a complete departure from the speed and the style of the entire match prior, Ricky Dozan throws a straight right hand to Kimura's jaw and staggers him. They clinch briefly and he pushes Kimura into the corner, raining down big open palm strikes to the head. Kimura is in serious trouble. He grabs the big man's midsection and tries to work his leg. And if he were to get the fight on the ground, it most likely would be a different situation entirely. But Ricky Dozan puts his arms on the ropes and the referee breaks them up. Even though things had now moved from the realm of simulation and theater to a real assault, this was still a televised pro wrestling match, and Kimura follows the direction. Perhaps he thought this would be the end of the onslaught, and Ricky Dozan would go back to working after he cooled down a bit. But that's not what happened. More palm strikes come, and Kimura looks confused, turning to the referee as if to say, what the hell is happening here? While he does so, a blow to the head knocks him to one knee. Ricky Dozan jostles with the now defenseless man before delivering a vicious knee to the face. He lines him up again, winds back, and this time delivers a kick. They both connect flush, and Kimura is not getting up. Ricky Dozan drags him to the center of the ring and stomps on the back of his head. Not in the sense of a pro wrestling stomp, but a sloppy, uncontrolled assault. More open hand strikes come as Kimura tries to get up and escape. There's a little bit of working thrown in now as Ricky Dozan tries one of those trademark karate chops. No doubt sensing Kimura is truly done and feeling comfortable inserting some of that spectacle that the previous assault was missing. Kimura manages to make it to the corner, a place perhaps offering some safety under pro wrestling rules. The referee inspects his heavily damaged face and simply instructs the two men to continue. The end comes as Ricky Dozan tees off on Kimura, delivering more of those huge palm strikes before the judoka simply slumps to the floor, unconscious. The referee counts 10, and Ricky Dozan is declared the winner. In the aftermath, he celebrates with the crowd, and shots of Kimura's face are horrifying, even in blurry black and white. There are two big questions after watching this match. One, why did Ricky Dozan double cross Kimura? And two, why did Kimura let it happen? I say let it because by all accounts, Masahiko Kimura was really not the kind of guy most men could put their hands on and walk away from. And yet, the judoka was absolutely dismantled by the former sumo. Was he just in shock at what was happening? Did he think Ricky Dozan was simply working extra stiff to get a good reaction from the crowd? Was he assuming the former sumo would let up and switch back to working at some point? Years later in his autobiography, Kimura would describe the fight this way. Quote, when I saw him raise his hand, I opened my arms to invite the chop. He delivered the chop, but not to my chest, but to my neck with full force. 
I fell to the mat. He then kicked me. Neck arteries are so vulnerable that it did not need to be Ricky Dozan to cause a knockdown. A junior high school kid could inflict a knockdown this way. I could not forgive his treachery." End quote. And according to Kimura, the original plan was to have the match end in a draw. That would create even more hype for a second match wherein they'd have a clean winner, and then repeat the cycle all over again. That would elongate the feud, sell more tickets, and make more money. And if we look to Kimura himself for any idea of why that plan was abandoned mid-match, well, we don't find all that much. All he really says in his autobiography is, quote, Once the bout started, Ricky Dozan became taken by greed for big money and fame. He lost his mind and became a madman, end quote. I mentioned the low blow earlier. Presumably it was accidental, but it seemed to have sent Ricky Dozan into a blinding rage where he abandoned the plans for the match and brutalized Kimura. And knowing the character of Ricky Dozan, that really doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility, but there may be a little more to it. Because in the lead up to the match, Kimura may have made a fateful mistake. You see, he publicly called into question Ricky Dozan's legitimacy as a fighter. Speaking to the Asai Shinbun newspaper, he insinuated that Ricky Dozan was a showman, and in a real fight, Kimura would win. That's according to both pro wrestling journalist Fumi Saito and the book Japan, The Ricky Dozan Years. Not only did these newspaper comments build anticipation for the match, they may have cast doubt on whether pro wrestling was real or not in an era where that was very much still up for debate, and Ricky Dozan made sure his match with Kimura was very real. There would never be a rematch between the two men. The immediate aftermath of the double cross very well may have put Ricky Dozan's life in danger. You see, both he and Kimura had connections to Japan's underworld, as all wrestling promoters at the time essentially had to. In his autobiography, Kimura says, quote, That night, I received a phone call informing me that several Yakuza are on their way to Tokyo to kill Ricky Dozan. But Ricky Dozan did not meet his end that night. Nine years later, however, in 1963, he would die after being stabbed in the gut by a member of the Yakuza. Although Kimura's ominous words about not forgiving treachery might come to mind, and some people online still claim his murder was in retaliation for the Kimura incident, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Ricky Dozan was stabbed in a nightclub bathroom during a fight with a man named Katsushi Murata. How and why the fight with Murata started is a point of contention. Some sources claim it all started when Murata stepped on Ricky Dozan's shoe. The two got into an argument, and the hot-headed wrestler attacked the man. Author Jonathan Snowden offers a far more interesting explanation in his book. He claims that Murata was part of a Yakuza group who had just lost the mafia contract, so to speak, on vending machines at pro wrestling events. Apparently, a much bigger Yakuza crew moved in and took over the vending machine racket from Murata's gang, which he was understandably a little unhappy about when he ran into Ricky Dozan that night in the bathroom. It almost sounds like the plot of an episode from some Japanese version of The Sopranos. Hell, there's even a half-baked theory out there that he was killed for supporting the unification of North and South Korea. But whatever the reason for his killing, he was deeply missed by the Japanese populace. His funeral was a massive event attended by 20,000 people, and he would go down as an icon of that post-war era of Japanese culture. As for Kimura, fate was a little more kind to him. Like something out of a Street Fighter game, he would travel the world, putting on wrestling shows and fighting worthy opponents for real. Eventually, he settled down with a university coaching position and trained the future judo champions of Japan. 